Hello everyone, my name is Rosemary Upmuti and I'm from the University of Reading. Land law lends itself to feminist perspectives for many reasons. A feminist analysis is one that's premised on the idea that gender is a fundamental organising principle in our society. That is that simply being born male or female determines how we're brought up, how we're viewed, what options are available to us and how we fare in law. Now, of course, gender norms change from uh, era to era and across different societies. But it would be a great mistake to assume that uh, just because we have gender neutral laws and we have equality legislation, that the law has an equal impact on all of us. Every legal principle is worth looking at in terms of how it's interpreted, how it's enforced, how it affects us in terms of our sex. And I'll just give you one example you might have come across uh, when you studied criminal law. You might remember that men who kill their female partners tend to be punished much less severely than women who kill their male partners. And there may be many reasons for this. Uh, one is that it's relatively common for men to kill. And so in a sense, it's become normalized in our society, whereas it's uncommon for women to kill. And as a result, it may be thought that a woman who does so is particularly evil and deserves particularly harsh punishment. Or it could be simply that most judges are men and they tend to be more sympathetic to men. But there are plenty of examples in land law and I'm about to turn to those now. Let's start with the idea of land as financial asset. One of the reasons why we study land law on the LLB and indeed that it's a compulsory subject is that it's so important in our society in terms of wealth. Land is probably the most important financial asset that any of us will have if we ever have our own homes. Um, and it follows that as men have more money than women, so men have greater access to this asset than women. Why men have more money is, of course, a matter of some interest. Historically, it's because men were established in our society as breadwinners and women as homemakers. The idea was that men should bring in the money, they should earn the money and support the women in their lives. Indeed, in the 19th century, a woman gave up her property to her husband when she married. As a result of this form of social organisation, it's always been hard for women to get mortgages. Um, historically, they were regarded as poor credit risks because it was thought they wouldn't have serious careers, they'd give up work when they married or they'd go part-time when they had children. Um, even if they did the same job as men until the 1970s, we didn't have equal pay, so they would earn less for it than men. And even today, there's a substantial uh, gender pay gap. Um, and we know that in times of hardship, it tends to be women who are the ones who were pulled out of the workforce, as has happened quite recently in the COVID-19 pandemic. But even though married women are no longer subsumed into their husband's legal identity as such, it's taken the courts a long time to accept they might have separate interests in property from the men in their lives. And I'll draw your attention to a case you'll study when you do overriding interests. That's the case of Williams and Glynn's Bank and Boland. And in this case, Mr. Justice Templeman at first instance uh, he went on to become a very distinguished law lord. Uh, he found it impossible to accept that Mrs. Boland would have a separate interest in land from her husband. Now, in the Court of Appeal, that was overturned. But it's interesting that that survived until the 1970s. 
And a second and connected reason why land lends itself to feminist perspectives is that it's concerned with the home. Now, it's not just concerned with the home. We look at other areas of land, of course, but the home's the one that's most relevant to most of us. And it's also quite an interesting area because so many interests might be concentrated in the one piece of property. And as I've just said, women are the homemakers, you might think that would give them particular rights in relation to the home, but that's not the way land law works. Historically, as I said, property tended to be uh, largely in the hands of men. That meant they were wealthy. Women, conversely, were dependent. And that meant that if a relationship should end, um, men would end up with greater assets than women. And that's a very powerful way, really, um, of keeping men in control and women relatively powerless. Uh, it's always worked to sustain what feminists call the patriarchy or a society organized in the interests of men. But that said, since the Boland case I just mentioned, property has generally been conveyed into the home, into the names of all the owners. And so when it comes to the family home, it's preferred that both the husband and wife or the male and female partners or whoever they are uh, should all be named on the uh, land register, should all be legal owners. Our co-ownership rules, which are uh, contained in the Law of Property Act and in the Trusts of Land and Appointment of Trustees Act, uh, our co-ownership rules are gender neutral. They treat everyone as an independent entity. But it's worth bearing in mind that gender neutral provisions only work well for people who know what they're doing and have equal bargaining power. And problems arise in situations, in couple situations, particularly where the man uh, has more money, more assets, more in the home, and the woman isn't aware of her rights and doesn't have equal bargaining power. That's where equity steps in, in the event of a dispute. Equity is often portrayed as a jurisdiction that's there to assist women in particular. And historically, um, the advent of the trust is actually attributed to the desire of courts to help women, particularly married women who'd had to give up their property, as I said, to their husbands. That's all very well, but it's both worth uh, bearing in mind that women only needed this assistance because the common law rules allowed men to exploit women, uh, and they did, of course. So in the contemporary situation, equity offers a route into co-ownership for those who don't already have a share in their partner's home, say you moved in with your boyfriend, um, or indeed for those who, who seek a larger share um, than that which they would get by the conventional means. You will study the various different ways in which the courts have used equitable principles to give these um, these people who are claiming a share an interest in the land. And nearly always, as you'd imagine, it's the woman who's making the claim because nearly always she's the one that doesn't have the share or has a small share. But for a long time, the share that equity awarded them was premised solely on financial contributions. The solution found was in the resulting trust. The resulting trust acts on the assumption that whatever you contribute, you get back in the same proportion. <clears throat> and of course, it follows then that those who put in more get more back. And as I've already said, it tended to be men who put in more and men who got more back. And all of this went towards perpetuating this patriarchal power that I spoke of. You won't find much on gender and practically nothing on feminism in your landlord textbooks. 
This is partly because textbook writers, certainly in land law, focus on the syllabus, on the black letter rules, um, and the syllabus doesn't really change from decade to decade. Uh, there's no harm, of course, in focusing on the rules. It's actually an important thing to know. It's useless to have a critique uh, of land law if you don't actually know what it is. But it's interesting how the textbook writers tend to admire the strict land law rules, which, as I said, work very well if you know what you're doing and you have equal bargaining power. They tend to be suspicious of equity when it's applied too broadly. Look at the critiques of some of what Lord Denning said in his cases. Uh, they like equity to follow rules that are almost as strict as those of land law. And they're even more suspicious of any intrusion of family law because they say family law is about people, but land law is about rights in land. And yet it's worth bearing in mind that uh, two of the most distinguished judges who've really pushed the law along in land law came from the family courts. And they were Lord Denning and Lady Hale, two of the most distinguished judges in the modern period by any, any standards. If you're interested in following this up, you'll find many articles in property law journals, in generalist law journals, and in specialist feminist law journals. It's quite a respectable subject. Um, and you mustn't imagine that feminism is one of those subjects that, uh, that isn't accepted in, uh, in academic scholarship. It is. But I'd also like to recommend two books that you'll find interesting, I hope. Uh, they're both in the Great Debates series published by Paul Grave Macmillan. And the first one is Great Debates in Land Law, which has chapters on most of the topics you'll cover in land law and treats them uh, in a, a socio-legal context, um, a critical context, um, which adds some interest, I think, to the bare rules that you'll be reading about in the textbooks. And the other book is Great Debates in Gender and Law, which I edited and which has chapters on 18 different um, areas of law, including all your core subjects and a lot of your options. And look particularly at the chapter on land law by Ambrina Manji. Now, I think that if you approach all your legal studies, asking yourself the question, does this principle or this practice or this enforcement, does it treat men and women the same way? Is the effect of the law the same on everyone? Then you'll find that feminist perspectives add a lot to your study of law. You might ask yourself, for example, uh, when you're doing adverse possession, um, why it was that uh, the courts found in Tech Build and Chamberlain that uh, children playing on the land didn't amount to factual possession for the woman who was claiming, whereas in other case law, um, cattle grazing on the land or uh, crops growing on the ground on the land did amount to factual possession uh, when the claimant was a man. Or you might look at the long history of um, undue influence in mortgage law. There are dozens of cases where the court was faced with a situation where property had been remortgaged to support a man's business, um, but the woman who was the co-mortgagee had been subjected to undue influence. And in many of these cases, the man defaulted and the uh, mortgagee repossessed the property, which was the family home, and so the woman lost her home. And yet the courts, until really after 20, 30 years, refused to accept that one way to ensure that this might not happen in future might be to, in, to, uh, to say to conveyances that they must give independent legal advice to women. Um, or indeed to men, but the case is always concerned women. Now, why were they reluctant to do this? Why did they say 
we don't like to intervene in private life. Why did they say it's too much trouble for the conveyances? Ask yourself, whose interests did this serve? And I think if you ask that, actually, of every area of law, you'll find that feminist perspectives illuminate your studies in a way that you're not going to find in the conventional textbooks.